Well, Jerry, thanks for taking this extra time. We we try to keep our regular shows around 40, 45 minutes, but there was another topic that I wanted to discuss with you from your book, um, some real insights that I had never uh, encountered before. And it revolves around what happened in the garden between the serpent and Eve. And in particular in chapter three, when Eve says that the serpent deceived me and I ate. Your book talks a lot about debt and debt relief, um, but one of the really cool insights that you bring out is that in the original language, there's, there's, I don't know if you would say it's synonymous, you can, you can break this down, but there's a close connection between this word deceit that Eve uses to describe what the serpent did to her, the crime that the serpent committed against her and the word debt. And so the idea would be that the serpent indebted me, I think is, is, is what you're, you're writing about there. So yes. can you tell us a little bit more about that connection and why it's significant? Um, yeah, happy to. So the word, the Hebrew word for debt and the Hebrew word for deceit are the same root. Hmm. Um, so if you see, not to get into a lot of Hebrew grammar, but sort of like the default mode of Hebrew is a cow, you know, a cow aspect, Q-A-L, cow perfect, okay. right? So okay. like, you know, when you learn a word in Greek or in Latin, you know, you you learn this a certain form and then oh, here's the passive, here's the whatever, right? Here's the participle. So that form um, uh, is to become a creditor. Um, okay. So now you put a he in front of it, and it's to be made something, right? So mm -hmm. if if I say I I did something, you know, then I then that's a cow. If I mm -hmm. say somebody made me do something or turned me into something, mm -hmm. that's the form that that's the form we have that the woman uses in Genesis okay. three. So, but if you're just seeing that, if you just look up that word in a Hebrew dictionary, you're going to see in debt, debt, nasa. Right. Later on, when Jeremiah says, I am neither a debtor to anyone, nor, you know, you know, mm. nor have I lent, it's that word. Hmm. Right. So I'm not saying that I would necessarily translate it as he indebted me. I'm right. saying that because it is the, the root word is debt, it clearly has those overtones right. that you can't read out of or or you know, rule that out of the, the passage. And I think because theologically we think kind of a religious way, we're not ready to think. If, you know, financially, we're slow to, we would not expect to find a financial statement from the woman at that point. Right. But, uh, you know, a Hebrew reader would look at that and say, and I think, I think what it's saying is in the Hebrew mind, um, beguilement and deceit and debt are associated with one another. Hmm. You are tricked into debt. Man. So, um, and then see, once we, once we allow that, if you, now, someone can believe me or not, right? And mm -hmm. Hebrew gr grammarians can argue about it. I mean, it's hard to argue with a lexicon that, that, that debt is within this zone of the meaning of this root word. Once you have that, well, then, wait, all this language about redemption in the Bible now, right. it's like, well, where's that coming from? Right. You know, because redemption <laughs> is paying somebody else's debt, right? Yes. Um, to buy them out of slavery. Well, I think it goes back to to Genesis one through three, you know, especially three. That's that's what that's what the redemption is from. Uh, so they are indebted, um, and so part of reversing that. So by the way, what happens? They're in the garden, right? Mm -hmm. So they're in the garden. So they don't have to toil in the garden. Mm -hmm. um, they're not planting. They can just reach up and eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's they they live in the garden. That's their home, right? And they right. are not indebted to anybody else i mean they mm -hmm. owe god everything but th there's not a debt relationship there all right so right. what happens the serpent deceives them and indebts them then god kicks them out mm -hmm. right and right. then they toil you know by mm -hmm. the sweat of their brow okay so let's go to the shemitah and jubilee laws what do they do they reverse all three of those things on the seventh year, you don't toil. You mm. your debt is forgiven, and in the fiftieth year, you're allowed back into your first home. Yeah, yeah you right? return home. You return home. Mm -hmm. So, 
I, I, it seems to me pretty clear that hmm. this this is ritual. The calendar is ritualizing, financially ritualizing <laughs> the return to yeah. Eden. All the yeah. things that the devil did and they did with their disobedience are now reversed. So, so, so would this be? Would, would you think? Would you say that by failing to observe that, um, for 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 the Israelites? as they failed to observe that seventh year release. Um, in a sense, they're choosing to live under, they're, they're choosing to continue to live under indebtedness to, to the fall. Like they're choosing to live under that system versus um, going back to God's original design or pointing, cooperating with God and pointing towards his ultimate goal for, for mankind. They are rejecting the invitation back to Eden. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So there, 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 there's so much um, imagery, and uh, I, I often refer to it as um, shadows. You know, in the, in the Old Testament system and in the Old Testament story, the narrative, there are so many shadow stories and so much symbolism that point us towards God's ultimate purposes and what he was going to do, what he is doing in Jesus. But that's one that I had not uh, heard before. But I think it's a beautiful picture, especially as you connect what they lost in Genesis 3 with the fall. And what were those again? They, they lost uh, so they lost, toil? They, they lost rest. to be able to eat without toil. They mm -hmm. lost the their home. Right. And they lost their status as debt-free. Yeah. Right. The serpent right. debts them. God exiles them. And now they have to toil. So mm -hmm. in the Shemitah Jubilee law, on the, in the seventh year, you don't toil, mm -hmm. um, just like they didn't toil in the garden. You are not indebted anymore. And in the 50th year, you get to go home. Yeah. Um, you, get, you, get, you get your ancestral land back. And you got to realize, you know, in, um, in Genesis, it talks about the promised land. When Lot is looking at it, it looked like gone Elohim. It looked like the garden of God. So the mm -hmm. promised land was kind of a new Eden or at least it was offered mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the possibility of a new Eden. But if yeah. they don't act Edenically, it's not a new Eden. What is it? It's a new Babylon. Yeah. And Babylon loved death. There's a whole thing here. I don't know if you want to get into it. But when Babylon <laughs> wanted to conquer a nation, they would send in easy money bankers, like easy creditors. Hmm. And the nation would get you know, the nation would get indebted. And at that point, then either debt or debt forgiveness become political power geopolitical power operators. So Babylon, before Babylon sent the army, they sent the credit cards, <laughs> you know, to break down thrift. Yeah. Um, so it, so Israel becomes a new Babylon rather than a new Eden. Well, I think that in my mind, there, there are some, I guess, some macro and some micro applications to this. On the, on the macro level, it's exciting to see that in the gospel and with Jesus, these are the things that we're being promised. We're being promised to be set free, to be liberated uh, in the ultimate sense. Um, and I, I truly believe, my own view is that the righteous will inherit the earth, that the coming yeah. age, we're not, we're not going to be um, uh, separated physically these these bodies that we have this physical world that we inhabit uh it's going to be renewed there's going to be a new heavens and new earth and we are going to have new bodies uh, resurrection bodies we're going to be restored like you're saying there we're which be... is the orthodox christian teaching for two thousand years and at yes. some point it became an escape <laughs> from reality and you know um because i function pastorally as well i've been to sermons where it's like oh well he went to heaven to be with jesus forever He's right. going to be with Jesus forever, but he's not going to be in heaven forever. Yeah, it's new heavens yeah. and new earth. The, the Bible teaches a We're resurrection meet, of the body. That's, that's right. We see we see heaven coming to earth. That's right. As as we move, and God and Jesus bringing the saints with him. Um, so yeah, home, we're going to in, in, in inherit the earth. Home is going to be restored, and then that the rest. You know, no more weeping, no more pain. Um, that those are going to be ultimately restored. So at that macro level, it's a beautiful picture of hope that, hey, what we lost um, because of the serpent and because of the fall in Genesis 3 is going to be restored. At a micro level, it really says to me that I need to be very aware of debt and the dangers of debt and and do everything I can to live wisely and to avoid becoming a slave to debt. Now, personally, I don't 
I, I have a credit card. I use it. I try to pay it off every month. So I think debt is not, you should never, from my own view, it's not that you should never engage in it. Right. Um, but I think you should be very, um, it's a dangerous thing. It's kind of like fire. You know, fire is an amazing yes. thing yes. if you know how to use it, <laughs> but it can be totally destructive if it's out of control. Yeah, I agree. I'm not, I'm not going to get legalistic about debt and say people aren't allowed to be in debt. Um, I mm -hmm. would say that there is an arc to debt that it can mm -hmm. be associated with. It's too easy to get. It's too easy to get Hishani yes. by it. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like alcohol. You, right. you have a glass of wine and it's, it gets easier to have the second, third, fourth, fifth, right? Right, um, right. So debt is a little bit like that. So it's kind of associated yeah. with vice, not right. sin or temptation. Mm -hmm. We are more likely to overestimate our ability to pay things back in the future than the reality. So we have to check right. our natural human. So to the degree that we're trying to live identically, I think we try to avoid debt, understanding mm -hmm. the addictive nature of it. We have periods of rest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, we try to be faithful with the property that we're, you know, that we oversee. So I think living identically is here and now, but um, no, mm -hmm. no, I wouldn't say Christians are not allowed to have debt. I would absolutely not say that. We have a line of credit on our home business and we, we, we pay it off. We have a credit card that we pay off every month. Um, so yeah, um, debt doesn't, that is not to some degree. And this is maybe the influence of Dave Ramsey. Debt has become like some kind of evil I agree. in people's mind rather than a tool to right. be used carefully. Yeah. And maybe if you, if you just, if you don't have that um, literacy, financial literacy, maybe you should go the Dave Ramsey route. But I, I think two passages that jumped to my mind, one is out of first Corinthians, don't be children in your thinking, but be mature. So you need to understand finances. I think a lot of Christians have just punted on economics and, and they don't see it as being connected to faith. You need to understand uh, finances. And then secondly, self-control, this is a fruit of the spirit. And if you don't right. have self-control in your finances, you know, they will, they will absolutely um, ruin your life and, and limit your, your witness and, and your availability for right. God. So well, uh, look, you know, at, look at Old Testament teaching about debt. What do you have? You don't have a debt yeah. prohibition. Right. Um, nor do you have un, you, nor do you have a God who's silent about debt. You mm -hmm. have debt structured and limited. I think yeah. that that kind of reflects. Yeah. You know, again, I'm not mm -hmm. saying we just go right from Shemitah laws to modern American law. We're not Israel. Lots of things have changed, but in terms of principle, that suggests a, yeah. a just like in every, in in every other area <laughs> of life, things that can be abused are structured and limited with guardrails about them around them to help you not abuse them. Well, Jerry, you are a bit of a Renaissance man. I know. Uh, obviously, you you're a pastor. Uh, you're or you you preach. Um, you. Um, I'm a transitional deacon, which I think in most people in most people who are listening would think of that as like associate pastor. Yes. Um. So. Um. Anyway, it's a different but, tradition. Yes. But but I know you are an economist. I know you've got a YouTube channel where you actually help people understand financial matters. So maybe we can link that um, or you could share it with us now. Where can people learn more about this specific area of finances? From yeah, that's a, that's a new area. So that's at YouTube. It's Eagle Investing Network, Eagle Investing Network, because the sponsor is the is Eagle um, Financial mm -hmm. Newsletter Publishing. So Eagle Investing Network on YouTube. Well, thanks for taking a little extra time to talk to us about debt, both how it affects our understanding of sin and what happened in the garden, but then also just some practical thoughts on uh, debt and living faithful as believers here in 2022. I really appreciate it. God bless.